All right, so welcome everyone to this webinar. We're, we're recording for whoever could make it. The theme is how to eat an elephant and maximize Pardot. This webinar is Pardot 101, but I think elephants is a more uh, fun title. The goal of this webinar is to give you the high level strategies and some gotchas on the technical side to Pardot. We're not gonna necessarily be able to cover every little feature. We're not gonna go over the navigation, some of the tactical things, and you'll understand why in a second, because really in Pardot, understanding why to do something and what to do is gonna be critical and you'll find it's very easy to learn the tool, um, especially if you're working with one of our trainers, very easy to do that. So more importantly to know what to do with it. And also for a lot of the people joining here today and go ahead, throw it in the webinar chat. What's your experience with Pardot? Throw that in the webinar chat. Those in the recording, we have a lot of fun on here. We just did some introductions. We talked about what state we're from. But go ahead and throw, what's your experience level with Pardot? Because I know we have a lot of Salesforce admins who are even more certified than I am uh, that are, are kind of curious, what's this thing with Pardot? And it, it kind of is a little different than everything you're used to on the Salesforce tool side. So it's part of the ecosystem, but there's, there's a lot to it. And this webinar is designed to get you all the strategy to, to know what to approach, what to attack, and then also the resources to go and get after the fact. So let's get right to it. And let's start with Gordon. Our beloved Gordon Ramsay, he will be our spirit animal for this webinar. And he's saying, first of all, let's just start with what we call it. It is par dot. It's not par do. It's not par dot. It, like, it's par dot. And, um, it, it's, and it actually means to market or to sell in another language. It's pretty cool. So that's what it's called. It's par dot. It's not par do. Um, and let's go from there. I am your executive chef for today. And we're all, we're all peers in here. And so... Um, I'm just here to help teach you and share you some of the recipes that I've been using today. And there's three numbers to introduce me to you by, and they're changing every day. But 10 is the number of years I've been working with Pardot. I love Pardot. I talk about it all the time, talking about it here today. Um, and by the way, I am going to throw a lot of details at you because 22, it's actually now 23, 100 is the number of Pardot implementations the Cheshire Impact has done. That's a lot of Pardot implementations. The good news is the 10 and the 2200, 2300, not necessarily sharing that to brag, well, hey, why not? But also really just to share that all the lessons learned that I'm gonna share with you today come from either my own experience using Pardot, getting those emails out, getting those nurtures built, or comes from um, our collective experiences. A lot of the, some of our, our, um, our customers have done some nurture emails that tricked me. And I, I encourage you to try that. You know, get those nurture emails, use those strategies, and then see if you can even fool me. And then it happens, and I love it. I sometimes I'll write back and say, was that a nurture? Did you just email me? Nope, it was a nurture, got me. So there's some cool stuff at play here. Can't wait to share it with you. 32 is the number of skydives that I've done. I love skydiving, I love hiking and mountain climbing. So I like to throw a little fun in there. Um, it's a little rainy to do another jump today, but maybe tomorrow, we'll see. Lastly, I am at Cheshire Impact. Uh, I'm also the CMO, I'm the founder, I'm happy to be here, but we're going to talk about Chesh later because we have way too much to cover. So let's get into it. And real quick, just want to break the fourth wall here. Well, we're all chefs. So many of you might have Salesforce certs. You may even teach me some Salesforce things. That'd be fantastic. We're all chefs here. I'm here to share some strategies with you. Um, and we're all in the kitchen. We're all uh, putting the dinners together, right? So uh, I'm going to really err on the side of discussion over presentation. Uh, I really do look at that webinar chat. So if you have questions and I can address it then, um, rarely sometimes I'll push it off to the Q&A, but I like to address things as they come up. So go ahead and throw stuff in that webinar chat, even if it's just to say that like you love that picture or whatnot, it keeps us all interested, it keeps it all interesting. Uh, and a little bit of change in flow makes it more fun to learn that way. So we're gonna do that. We're also gonna talk reality over that silver bullet BS you may hear in a lot of like pitchy presentations, as you can tell from me wearing a chef jacket. We're not pitching here, we're trying to teach here. So we're also gonna have experience share over that pitching. So again, let's have fun here, break the fourth wall. Uh, I wish you could be here with me. We're all in the same room together, sharing the bean bags and all that. But if not, hey, at least we can chat and we can send stuff over. If you do have questions, you're a little sensitive, you can always throw those in the Q&A and nobody else will see necessarily the question and the answer because we'll answer the Q&A at the end of the presentation. But the chat, everyone can see it. You can have fun, you can see your fellow marketers. All right, here's the challenge. We said how to eat an elephant, how to eat this Pardot thing. Whether you're a Salesforce admin or you're a marketer, you're new to this, uh, maybe you just joined a company and they have Pardot and now you're gonna send an email out in two weeks and you're like, oh no, 
well, we've got resources for you, uh, but this will really give you a sense for what the heck this Pardot thing is. The challenge is, you know, the, there's that phrase, right? How to eat an elephant. Well, the, in your, in, do you, how do they answer that? For those, throw it in the chat. How do you answer, how do you eat an elephant? Just throw it in the chat. I know you know this. Somebody's got to know this. It's like, a, it's like an old fable. How do you eat an elephant? Um, there's a secret to it. Okay, Amy's the first one at it. One bite at a time. Thank you. Um, one bite at a time. Well, I, well, what would it know? How many bites does an elephant have? Did the math. And this is a forest elephant, roughly 5,000 pounds. Did the math. There's 160,000 bites. So if you're going to eat that elephant, get chewing, right? Well, I compared, I compared to that. And, oh, you share, hey, Deborah, bonus points. You share the elephant, right? Share that. Share those pounds. Good call. Um, with Pardot, I did some math. There's some navigational menus. There's some, a lot of results on Trailhead, which is a great resource for learning Pardot. Let's say you have multiple buyer demographics as well that you're trying to address in your Pardot account. Man, there's, there's even more bites than an elephant, right? So that's the challenge that we're going to try to address here today. Now, a lot of the tactical to-dos we're going to save for later. Why? Because of this. What's interesting is, especially if you've got those Salesforce certs, you're used to Financial Service Cloud, Sales Cloud, Service Cloud, all the other clouds in the ecosystem. Uh, this is kind of a crazy image, right? So it, it's not the tech that kills you in Pardot. And no one's going to get hurt today, let's be fair. But what we want to be cautious in understanding that in Pardot, it's not the tech. It's, it's the strategy. What do I do? Routinely, we can teach um, you, if you're on here, uh, we have training programs. We can get you up to speed on Pardot very quickly. The question, yeah, Jay, I can feel the heat too. Absolutely. It thing's hot. Hot. Back up. It's almost burning my eyes. The, the, the trick here is just knowing what to do. Not, you know, okay, now you know how to build an email with Pardot. Well, what are you going to send? You know how to do drips. What are you going to have it drip? What are you going to have it do? So that's really important thing to think about. And um, along with that, here's what we're going to address today. Uh, first of all, just chatting a little bit about my own part out experience. And then the bulk of this, the bulk of the course, um, table four and table six, we're going to have the four principles of marketing automation. Um, and throughout, there's just four key words. Like if you left here going, Casey's goofy, he had a chef hat on, and I remember the four words, that's what I want you to remember. So we're going to talk about those. They're the four principles of marketing automation, and each one allows us to dive in a little bit to the tech. I mean, I, we can't help but show some of that. A little bit of the tech. And then at the end, we're going to talk about a roadmap. We have a roadmap for the direction we want you to go when you are working with Pardot. Because it's not just, hey, let's just randomly go ahead and throw the, the um, box of eggs in the in the oven, no, 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 you gotta make the cake first, right? You can't just skip a step. So there are some steps to follow. So we're gonna share those with you. And finally, there's some resources at the end um, and then also Q&A. And we're gonna pause, you know, we stop the recording for the Q&A, um, but we stay as long as we need to. So if you have any questions, throw those in there. Okay, let's have some fun. There is a game or a contest today. Um, and, and here's the deal. A lot of these different things we're gonna talk about, I'm going to say, Something to the effect of, look, there's a webinar for this, or we just did a webinar on this. It's because one, I love webinars like this. They're great for communicating points. And then two, we, we literally have at least two a month on every different subtopic of some of the things we're gonna cover. So it can't you know, cover an hour's worth in one slide. So you may hear me say very often, there's a webinar for that or something to that effect. Count the number of times that I say that. And at the end, we're gonna give you an email address and you email, how many times um, that I've said this. And if your number is right or really close to being right, uh, they will be prized. There'll be prizes and giveaways and maybe some swag or maybe some, some, uh, some strategy time. We'll see, it's a whole grab bag. But consider uh, just making a tick mark every time you hear me say there's a webinar for this. And great question, Karsha. I haven't, I haven't started yet. Uh, as soon as I get to the next slide, that's when we start counting. Great question, Sad. absolutely. Uh, otherwise, I would have just said three already, right? So it begins now, but just know we have lots of webinars, and, I'm, and I, now I have permission to be able to say this a lot. Okay, my first webinar experience, just kidding, my first part out experience, but we'll count that one, we'll count that one. Um, my first part out experience, this is how it went. I was a digital marketer, um, you know, using Google Analytics, hacking that around, doing a lot of PPC ads, that kind of thing. I inherited a mess. It was an account. Um, it was actually on a, another system that was on NetSuite. It took three hours to send emails out. And it was crazy. And so looked around, found Pardot, purchased it, 
implemented it and started using it. And it just, it changed my life, it changed the career, changed the company I was at. It was amazing. Um, and so we started using the drips. We started using the capture, um, the forms we're going to talk about. And one thing that they did, they had, a, they had one form on the website. And it had 12 fields in it you had to fill out. No one wants to fill out 12 fields. And once you filled it out, you got the newsletter. And no one wants a newsletter. And you got a call from a sales rep the next day. You didn't want to talk to them. They didn't want to talk to you. That wasn't working out well. So we got part on. We got these really sweet, optimized forms. We have these nurtures automatically happening behind the scenes, creating some engagement. So our leads increased just by using the Pardot forms on our site. And we'll explain why it's coming up. We also got high quality leads because we're engaging them. When I first got on a call with someone, um, one of our leads before this, one of the questions they asked our sales rep was, who are you again and what do you do? They didn't even know what we did and they're on the phone with us. So we made sure we gave sales higher quality leads by educating the, the prospects before they got to sales with some engagement, some nurturing, that kind of thing. Sales loved it. I went from being some anonymous marketer to being Casey, the marketing guy, and they even took me out for sushi. That's how you know sales likes you is when they take you out to lunch. Um, and the company grew, and then I, I was able to show ROI. And so CEO, instead of saying, okay, um, how much money do you really need? Can you have half? He said, oh, you did all that with 5K? Could you do that with 10K and 15 and 20? They started throwing budget at me. So this stuff works. It's amazing. Um, I'm happy to share more details of my story with you one-on-one -on -one, um, and kind of walk you through that. But it's an awesome tool. And that's what got me started on the road to every company I went to. I would start migrating them onto Pardot. And eventually Cheshire Impact came from that. Just from working with Pardot and loving and using the tool, that's where we came from. So that's the experience. And that really sets me up to tell you about this. These are the four words. So if, the, if you remember, uh, I dressed like a chef. <laughs> you don't have to remember that. And, and you remember these four words, then that is what matters. So capture, nurture, automate, report. Reporting, report, and ROI. Um, those are the most important words. And this is exactly what marketing automation does. All the different cool features we're going to show you, they all tie into this. Uh, whether it's the forms tying to capture, the nurturing emails, the automation side of it, and the reporting side. Uh, and so we're going to basically now go through each and every one of these words to give you examples, to show you them in practice, and also talk through them and describe them. And we will also highlight any time that we have a webinar on that particular topic. <laughs> awesome. Let's get into it, these four spicy words. By the way, what are those words again? Capture, nurture, automate, report. Those are the ones to write down, screenshot, you know, get a tattoo, all the above, those are the words. Okay, let's talk capture. So the idea with capture is, at, at, a, at the very basic level, there is website tracking code um, that Pardot has. And this goes on your website, it's very much like a, a Google Analytics in that it, it tracks how many people come to the site and all that kind of thing. But instead of being anonymous, which Google likes to do, they want to protect privacy, unless they're paying for it, right? They want to protect privacy. But in Pardot, we know specifically who people are if we're able to capture them. And, and the way that you're able to know if someone is, goes from being anonymous to being a known visitor, which in Pardot we call a prospect, if they become a prospect in Pardot, they did either one of two things. They, they either clicked on a link in a Pardot email, an email that's sent by Pardot, or if they fill out a Pardot form on your website. If you take two of those, one of those two actions, you will go from being just anonymous visitor to being, hey, my name is Casey Cheshire and I've gone to all these different pages. So the first part is that Pardot's able to, to see and track all of the web activity that your prospects are doing. A uh, great question, is a prospect a lead or a contact? So this is a, a tricky point that gets a lot of folks from the Salesforce side, which is, you know, what are, how does it fit into the objects? Uh, in Pardot, a prospect can be a lead or a contact in Salesforce. Uh, in Pardot, it doesn't care whether you're one or the other, and it'll sync either way with them. And we can talk more about the syncing in a second. Um, and does, and we have a question, does progressive profiling work only in Pardot landing pages? You're skipping, actually, you're not skipping too far ahead, maybe one or two slides. Great question. Um, progressive profiling only works on, uh, with Pardot forms. So in here you see efficient lead capture forms. If, as long as you're using a Pardot form, either on a Pardot landing page or on your own landing page, but dropped in it using an iframe, 
if you're using either the iframe or a Pardot form on a Pardot page, you can benefit from what's called progressive profiling, AKA magic, which we'll talk about. And that's where your forms basically dynamically change based on what you know about someone. So the first part is the tracking code, knowing what they're up to, and you can change their score based on this. You can have automations fire off based on this. If they visit the career page, take them off the list. If they visit the buy now page, add them to a list, right? You can do all sorts of really cool things knowing where they go. Um, and then this information can then be sent to sales to show them what is up. The efficient lead capture forms, uh, you don't need to use HTML if you're using them on a Pardot form on a Pardot page, or you can certainly tweak and customize and all that kind of thing. The neat thing with the Pardot capture forms is that let's say you do drop uh, the form on your WordPress page using an iframe. You can then go back inside your Pardot account, change the fields and the layout of it, and that'll automatically update on the iframe on that page. So it can be much more efficient, especially if you have to put out a request to have someone change your actual website or an actual web page. To be able to change it up in Pardot is huge. And again, if I go through something that you have a question for, throw it in there on the chat. Um, yes, keep doing that. So June 13th, I got married. It's a pretty cool time. I gotta tell you, it's been a couple years from now. But here's the question out to everyone in the webinar chat. How many times, if you're married, how many times um, did you go on a date with someone before you got married? And if you haven't gotten married yet, how many times do you envision going on a date with someone before getting married? So go ahead, throw the number in the chat. We got, we got to see what we're dealing with here. How many times did you go on a date before you got married? Bobby, you're living dangerous. I love it. One. <laughs> it's crazy. Did you really? Uh, Paul, 20. Bobby, 100%, huh? Right on. Uh, seven, you just knew. You just knew. Love at first sight. Dated seven years. Yeah, I'm with you, Deborah. Jay, five years of dates, right? You can't even count. Marsha, 30. A million, says uh, Shauna. Dating for three years, two dates a week, 312. Hey, great math. Well, in some countries, there's no dating culture. Very interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. And not married to my, to my knowledge. Well, hopefully you would know. Good, good. So thank you all for sharing that. The point of bringing this up is we're often, you know, we're not necessarily expecting um, people we, we date, uh, you know, people we meet to just marry at first sight, but somehow we're expecting our prospects to want to get married the first time they meet us, the first time they come to our website, we're asking them to get married, get hitched. Look at this crazy form. Not only is, you know, first name, last name, email, phone, company. Um, and this isn't a, this isn't a, fa oh, the fancy tux. Uh, yeah, I'm, you know that I own that tux. Come on, Jay. Uh, no, the, on the last <laughs> Yeah, but look at all the fields on here, right? Company name. How many employees work there? What's your website URL? Look, it's still good. It's still going. It's still going. Is that a HubSpot form? HubSpot, what are you doing? Who wants to fill out all these things for a quick little white paper? I don't know. Maybe with autofill, but, but still, I've seen some forms where they ask you, what's your company revenue? I've seen, what's your personal income every year? I've seen, you know, it's, it's just sort of blood type and social security number, right? Yeah, I love it, Caitlin. Who wouldn't want to get married after filling that out? Well, hopefully we are getting married after answering all these questions. Like, look at this. I'm going to spend more time filling this form out than I am going to be reading your stupid document. Well, here's the deal. No one wants to fill that thing out. And there's some stats on this, kind of a cool, busy math chart for those that are big into the math. On the far right, that, that's the, our long form. And all this is showing is that the shorter you make your form, the higher the conversion rate, and technically, the cheaper you're able to acquire new leads. So the math works in your favor, the shorter the field goes, because more people want to fill that thing out. And, and Jeb, what about the, uh, the business email? Yeah, you can certainly... I do, I do prefer to ask the, the work email. You never know if you get the Gmail, but it's always good to try to get that work email because then you can tie it into their domain as opposed to wondering if they work at Gmail or if it's a personal address. More money, more problems, exactly. So here's the deal. We don't want to have long fields. One of the things I like to tell people, and this, this one's a little more conservative, but typically what we've seen is every field that you get rid of can increase your conversion rate by anywhere from a half a percent to I've seen even 3%, right? So it depends on how crazy that question is that you're asking. But every single field you can get rid of increases the number of leads you get. It's fantastic. So like, hmm, do I want more leads or do I really need to know number of employees right now? 
but you don't need to know it right now. Why don't we go on some dates with our prospects? And so the whole point of that is to introduce you to what's called progressive profile. And there was a great question about it earlier. And this is what Pardot can do. And a lot of this is out of the box. So first thing to know, when you have a Pardot form, it'll never ask the same question twice unless you break it and tell it to. Don't do that. So if it already knows your first name and your cookie, then Pardot goes, okay, I already know your first name. I know your email. I know your last name. If they see a form, those questions will automatically not show up for them. Why? Because you already know the answer. What this does is it automatically decreases the number of fields, which automatically optimizes your forms. So as long as you're not breaking it, using Pardot forms, even without setting up progressive profiling, you're going to have a benefit. You're going to have a higher conversion rate. The cool thing is you can then take it the next step, which is scheduling it out so that you can have several different forms and each one can ask different questions. It's the same form in Pardot, but you can just tell the individual fields how to behave. And what you do is you essentially tell the, the, the fields at the very beginning, just act like yourself. You tell the fields in the second form right here, you say email, uh, that'll always show up. But you say company, phone, and, qual and qualify, some sort of qualification question. You guys don't show up until we've asked the role question. So as soon as we know their role, then you can come up. So what this does is if somebody comes back a second time, and not, not for the same piece of content, but you can use the same form for multiple different kinds of piece of content, just with a different completion action. What this does is it means the first time they come, they get a, a really short form and you get their, in, their email and their info. You start nurturing them, you send them some other content, with a link to a landing page and they fill out the second form. And then they could come back a third time to get your more content. And maybe even after they get the first piece of content, you say, hey, if you like that, here's a link to go get another piece right now. Like why wait? So what this does is it gets more of their, it gets all that information you would have gotten earlier, the 12 fields or whatnot, even some qualification questions that can be great to, to pass off to sales, but without inflicting the pain of trying to get like a one night stand with your prospects. Instead, you're dating them slowly and steadily. I had a question. Have you encountered progressive profiling not working after you make updates to fields in the admin section of Pardot? Uh, no, but sometimes it, what can be tricky is um, if the, the logic that says why something should or shouldn't show up. Sometimes if you make a change to a field, the logic in that other field that's dependent on it may be tied to something that no longer exists. So I do routinely then go back through to make sure that's okay. And one of the things I like to do is have, you know, start with a single form, then clone it over and over again. So I know that the logic's all the same. But yeah, that in, you can always shoot me a link or, you know, shoot me a picture of your form. Uh, I'll have my information at the end and we can take a look at it for you. That's, that's certainly something to look at, but go ahead and look at the, the criteria of what makes those fields not show up. And see if maybe they're dependent on something. Uh, especially if you have the, you can also have fields that only show up. Like if I said my role was a marketer, I could have a follow on question that says, what are you the senior level marketer? Are you a marketing coordinator? Or I could say, you know, if you're in sales, are you executive leadership or are you everybody else? Right. You can have follow on questions and those might have issues if you change the drop down criteria. So something to look at. Can progressive profiling help with GDPR requirements? That's a great question. You know, it, it could come into play, and we could talk a little bit more on the Q&A side about maybe how we go into it. Um, I actually had a recent interview on a podcast, which we'll talk about um, in the resources section, where I interviewed an attorney all about GDPR for like an hour. So uh, we'll, we can get you a link to that once we get to that section. But in general, for the GDPR, it's one of the questions that you have at the very beginning, right? So the very beginning, you can have a GDPR checkbox or question. As soon as they've said it, as soon as they've answered it, you don't need to keep asking them because they've enrolled and you have their enroll, you have their enroll date, you're good. And the good news is you don't have to keep having them check or keep having them agree every time because you've already qualified them at the beginning. All right, best to offer open text for qualified questions or drop down. Always drop down. Great question, Deborah. Whenever you can, these qualified questions, these are like BANT, um, some kind of sales qualification questions. And we, by the way, we have a whole webinar on qualification questions and grading and scoring. So if you have a question about how Pardot can grade and score, we have a whole webinar on that. Um, but yeah, it's always good to have a drop down in those forms so you can control the outcome in your logic and all the other automations that will follow. They're, they're, you can like predict what will happen. Otherwise, how do you put Chief Awesome Officer into your workflows? I, I don't get hit with the spam, what's going on? Great question. 
here's just a picture of Pardot when you are doing that progressive profiling. It's some tips and tricks to keep track of when you're doing that. We're doing pretty good on time, so I'll, I'll cover these in a little more detail. Here's a form in Pardot. If you haven't seen it, it's really friendly. It's super friendly. These little things over here, these carrots let you drag fields up and down. You can edit them and you can delete them. It's very straightforward. When you see an A, it means they're always going to show up. No matter what, email will always show up. That's okay. That's how you. That's how you know who people are. If you do see a C, that's for conditional, and that means only have this show up if a condition has been met. If they've answered a question a certain way, or if they've done something you want them to do, then you can have this show up as like a secondary question, um, or it could be that progressive profiling we were talking earlier. You know when we said earlier in this slide. Let me go back to that. There it is. We had first name, last name, email, role, and then those other things. Here's what that looks like on a form. First name, last name, email, always shows up. Role, they can choose marketing, great. Company, phone, let's see, RM to use those other questions. They won't show up until you've answered the first four. If we have the answers to the first four, then we will go automatically go to the, the next questions in the list, and so on, and so on, and so on. And, we, and you can have unlimited layers for this, but I like to plan for three. Plan for three form completions. And I usually like to have them have the same criteria. So in this form, company, phone, and what CRM, which is our qualification question, right? Because if you use Salesforce, Cheshire Impact can help you. If you don't, you should switch to Salesforce, right? So qualification question, there's three. All of those questions are looking to see if you've answered role. If you've answered role, these three will pop up and role won't. So that's the way you do that. Oh, great question. Cheryl asks, why not ask location? Great question. If we had a buzzer and we had like candy, I'd throw it out to you. That's fantastic. The reason why is that Pardot has the ability to automatically identify your location based on IP address. This is huge. And we know from earlier, every field we can get rid of, like state and country, all the better. It's going to increase our conversion rate. So what you do, it's in the account settings. There's a little tiny checkbox. If you scroll down, you check that off. And then automatically, every time a form gets completed, if they're in the US or Canada, it'll not only put country, it'll put state or province as well. If it's not in the US, it'll at least put the country. And you can do automations based on that, you can do grading and scoring based on that, and it's fantastic. So great question, that's why you won't see in mind location, because we still, we still use location for routing on the sales side, but we don't need to anymore ask it because it's already being asked by Pardot. Great question. Does it get city? No you would have to ask city. So if you are doing some, you know, like differentiation, like some people own two different state, two different places in, a, in an area, you would then ask separate questions. You might do that on the second form though, because you could technically have that pop up. If we know their state, which would happen in the first form, you can automatically ask the question, what city? And that way they still have to answer city, but they don't have to answer the other two. It's a great question. Um, all right, plan for three, unlimited layers, phone numbers, uh, buzz, buzz, Careful, phone numbers is a text field in Pardot. Don't put number field because if it sees dashes or parentheses, it freaks out and doesn't tell your users why. So make sure those are text in Pardot. Um, and don't ask location, talk about that. And I don't like to play required games. I like to say this is optional and this isn't. I like to say hey, everything you see here is required and I just don't abuse it. I ask you, in this case, four questions that you don't mind answering. And, and the reason I do that is because I don't want people to have to think, is this required, is this not required? just a tiny little star. If you mess that up, maybe you don't want to complete it in the future. So I don't like to play games with that. But to do that, I also have phone number the second time around. Um, and it is required as opposed to being optional the first time. Otherwise, no one ever fills it out. Great questions. What if your leads travel often? Yeah, great question, Bobby. Um, should we ask for state then? Um, real quick tangent on that. Real quick, we did a study on that because not only that, but what if someone you know, is traveling to your point, or they're on, they're on a VPN, uh, they, they may be, get tagged somewhere else, right? I'm at Dreamforce, I'm gonna get tagged San Francisco instead of New Hampshire, where I'm at right now. True, but what also happens is if you ask them, they also get it wrong, and it's at about the same rate, right? If you're at Coca-Cola, and I ask you what state, do you put Atlanta, or do you put your regional bottling company in Rochester, or you're working remote, uh, you know, out of like Nashua, New Hampshire, do you put that instead? That can be a tricky question to answer. So there's always gonna be a little bit of that troubleshooting. So my preference then is to remove the fields, increase the conversion rate, and then we'll sort it out on the back end. And it's only a few cases that happen here and there. Not as many as you'd think. And also it's just as many people get it wrong anyways. 
So again, I'd rather have the increased amount of leads, the higher conversion rate, and then deal with it then. But great question on the traveling. Uh, do you recommend we set the character limit on the phone number? We've noticed some numerous issues on some of our forms because of the phone field. That's an interesting question. I probably need to know more about that. So if you wanna, we can kind of troubleshoot in the Q and A, maybe shoot me some more details about it. Um, I don't, you, I haven't seen that kind of a problem. So I wonder what's actually going on there. So it's a, it's a good one to, uh, to kind of follow up on. All right, let's keep moving. Cause we got places to go and people to see. We talked about capture and honestly, it's one of my favorite. I think capture gets completely ignored for nurture and nurture is important. We're going to talk about it, but capture is so powerful. Like, do I want to send my nurture emails out or do I want to get more leads? You literally, if you use part out forms, your leads increase in, because they're optimized. It's just it, the best way it is. And it's so much easier to ask less questions. So capture is huge. Now we're on to nurture, capture, nurture, automate. By the way, there is a webinar all about nurturing. So if you go crazy on it and you enjoy it, or you want a little more detail on what's called Engagement Studio, which is how Pardot does this, there is in fact a webinar on this topic. <laughs> All right, gotta keep, gotta, keep us, gotta keep us fresh, gotta keep talking about those webinars. All right, nurturing, what does Pardot do? Well, here's the challenge. Because we're spreading out those questions over multiple forms, we're, no, we're gonna be dating our prospects, right? We're not gonna just go over all at once. Hey, fill out this 12 field form and let's get married. And your sales rep's gonna call you tomorrow. Most people don't want that, right? They wanna get your content if it sounds tasty, but they don't wanna commit right away. So because of that, we need to get them to come back to fill out more forms, right? Our form only has four things. And you're like, I can't send it to sales. I don't have their phone number yet. So we gotta get them to come back. So to do that, that's where nurturing comes in. Nurturing also helps out when people say, this sounds great, but call me in six months. You're like, hmm, well, we could do that. Um, let's put you on a nurture campaign as well. And we'll talk about an example of that. So here's the strategy. We're using these emails to nurture people. And on the right-hand side, you can see just a screenshot of what an actual live nurture program looks like uh, in what's called Pardot Engagement Studio. It's very drag and drop. It's very much like a Visio diagram where you can decide what emails happen and you can't, maybe can't quite see the, the text in there, um, probably because it's a real campaign that we have, but you can not only decide to send an email, but you can add them to a Salesforce campaign. You can then wait to see if they clicked, if they have, you could change their campaign in Salesforce. You can send them a different email the next time. You can decide, there's all sort of different decision trees. And so this one's sort of very straightforward and linear, but you could very well, if people are engaging, you can maybe send emails sooner kind of speed up the sales cycle. And if they're not sending, if they're not clicking, if they're not engaging, oftentimes we've had um, some great success. A lot of our clients have used these sort of like wake up nurture campaigns. So if you don't click on anything, you're not responding, before we delete you, they put you in this special category, which is where they send you emails with crazy subject lines and their best content ever. And they just, they just try to wake you up to see, are you even alive? Do you have a pulse? And then at the end of that, they'll delete you to save room in their account. Good stuff. Uh, it's all about programming and sequencing here. Here's an example of a personalized email. When we say nurtures, we don't mean send the same spam, but in a programmatic fashion. What we're saying is, let's send a personal email that helps somebody out. It's not very salesy and it's on a regular basis. And what this does is it, it, it bridges the gap from when people are ready to also giving them content. And so here's a good example of it. And by the way, we have a whole webinar on how to write these emails. Um, it's fantastic, it's fun, and I dive more into it. But you know, the, the, the brief summary here is that this is a, it was actually a nurture email sent from Pardot to one of the clients. And, and the way this worked is that this person had said, you know, Scott, this sounds great, I wanna buy Pardot, but I'm not ready, can you call me in six months? And so he said, sure, no problem. Put Kristen on a drip campaign. She got an email just like this from him on a regular basis. And there's a format for this, there's, there's ways to do it, um, and obviously we talk more about that. So just note that it's short, it's sweet. Below this graphic, it's cut off, but it would be his signature line. Check out the subject line, it's not very marketing-like, right? And it might offer a case study, something helpful, something simple, and it's short and sweet and to the point. These are the most successful type nurture programs, and you put those in here. Uh, great question, Jerrica. Where can you find out all about these webinars? Great question. Um, well, if you've, if you've signed up for this one, you're gonna be on our list to get notified every time we have them. And we have at least two, if not three a month. So you'll be on, 
on the list to receive those. And I think one of the things we should do based on your question is we should probably send a follow-up to this email, to this webinar um, with a list of all the previously recorded ones. So if you don't want to wait, you just want to go to town, we can get you a list of the webinars. That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Would you have the sales team do these or the marketing team? Great question, Deborah. This is actually in Pardot. So what you do is you build these in Pardot and they come out and you can have it dynamically put the sales rep that's associated with that account or that lead be the one sending it. So that's, Scott just put her on a drip campaign and a list and Pardot took care of all the rest. And so the cool thing was when you do it this way, if when they're ready and Kristen actually replied to this, which is why we have this. Um, and in that webinar, we actually show you her response, which is really cool. Um, it'll go right to Scott. It goes right to your sales reps because it came from them. It, came, it looks like it came from them. The reply goes right to them. So marketing doesn't have to be in the middle of that. We just sent the email. And now sales can close it down to do what they need to do. Great question. Are these sales looking emails sent as operational emails or marketing emails? They're sent as marketing emails because they're not operational. If you, if you made them operational, that'd be cheating. Um, so technically they are marketing emails, but notice you don't have to make them look like a marketing email. You know, marketing emails, oftentimes we kind of do this thing in marketing where we put a logo at the top right hand corner or we put big graphics and I've never sent a personal email that had my logo in the top corner of the email, right? So there's certain things you can do to make it look more personal uh, and, and not um, kind of interfere with that whole process. Great question. And if you have questions about the operational emails, we can cover that too. Can you put that email in Salesforce instead of Pardot? You could, you could. The advantage to using Pardot to send the emails out is that Pardot has all the tracking in the world. And if they click on a link in a Pardot sent email, now you know exactly who they are and they're cookied and they, uh, you know, all their history and you can notify sales about them and sales can even look at their history it, it ties all of the whole picture in together. Their lead score and grade can change based on their, their engagement and interaction. So, so Beverly, to answer your question, you definitely want to send these emails from Pardot. They're, they're bringing those two functionalities closer and closer together. Um, but with Pardot, you have that tracking. And that tracking is priceless. So that's where you want to get it. Um, and or I'm not sure what your question was, but uh, the engagement, but Feel free to say it again. Can tracking data captured in Pardot be used for reporting in Salesforce? Good question. Um, they're looking to make it close, more and more like an activity that's tracked in Salesforce. Right now, it's still sort of a, in the realm of sales, in the realm of Pardot, um, but they're getting closer and closer. You can generate lists. You can dynamically add people to campaigns. There's ways of doing it, Sad, so that you can get that information over to the Salesforce side and vice versa. You can always hit me with a use case and we can, we can build it together. Okay, cool. So last thing here, in the words of Gordon Ramsay, get that newsletter out of here. And I'm sure if he said it, there'd be several other words in here, but hey, we don't know who's listening to this webinar, right? Um, but the Hardcore Marketing Show, we, we can use the potty language there. But anyways, get that newsletter out of here. The whole point of the drip campaigns is that you don't need to be doing newsletters anymore. The thing with newsletters is they're not evergreen. Evergreen is a concept in Pardot ties into the automation, which we'll talk about next, is the idea that you can build an email that goes out to someone, offers them some content that's just as timely today as it was yesterday, as it will be in a couple days. Newsletter is often very timely, where it's like, this thing happened today. Um, and, and even if maybe they're offering things that are evergreen, what ends up happening is, the, by the very nature of a newsletter, you send out content today, you have to create a new one next month, and the next month after that, and next month after that. What you'd rather do is actually build a drip campaign where you have your best content put forward. Oftentimes with a newsletter, you run out of steam after say six to nine months. Your best content happened at the very beginning. Real quick example of that. I used to write, um, do some uh, reporting for a travel magazine in New Hampshire. It's all about travel and tourism and cool things you could do in New Hampshire. Well, New Hampshire, it's a pretty small state. For those of you who said California and Texas, I think we could fit like 90 of us in you, right? So we're a pretty small state. After about a year and a half of working for this magazine, we went from writing about really cool stuff like a hockey academy and all these other things to the Model Railroad Museum. So things got pretty bleak. What do we report on? We've already wrote about everything. That can happen in newsletters too, especially when you first get to a company. You're all about it. And then you sort of like, by the end of it, you're like, hmm, maybe I need to go to a new company with fresh ideas. The idea is to take your best content and then your second best content and your third best content and to put that in a drip campaign 
So no matter when someone comes in, they, they become a lead today, prospect, they become a lead tomorrow, or nine months from now, they can still go in that same flow. What that does, that frees you up from doing that monthly newsletter campaign. You put all that effort into it and you're wondering if people are gonna look at it. Instead, you build a nurture and drip campaign that gets that really good content out to everybody and they get your best content. And the person that comes nine months from now gets your best content. Cool. All right. Let's talk automation. Capture, nurture, automate. Automate is huge. Got to get those, those mixers. I saw a deal. This mixer was on sale from $800 to $400. Like, that's still expensive. So automation is all about and tying to the drip campaigns. So that's a form of automation. Automation is all about making your job easier and really automating some of that busy work, especially if you're a marketing coordinator. I've been there. I was like, oh, I need help over here seeing all these emails. Well, if you start automating different emails and different functionalities, you can free up your time as a marketer to do more of the strategy. That's the fun stuff. Strategy, testing, writing more content, everything else in the world because Pardot's doing the busy work for you. Um, so oftentimes you'll primarily see the automation side of Pardot revolving around taking a lead when it's ready and sending it to sales' attention. And now the behind the scenes, that's when a prospect in Pardot does enough activity does enough things, answers enough questions, you've got their phone number, they filled out the second form, you can automatically send them over to Salesforce, attention, the sales rep they need to go to. And you can actually do the sorting in Pardot. So based on the city, like you heard earlier, um, in someone's example, or for us, it might be state, country, you can do that sorting in Pardot. So when it sends it over, it automatically knows where to go. You also could tell it to let um, Salesforce continue to figure it out if you've already got uh, automations over in Salesforce to sort and do lead routing. You already got that figured out. You can just tell Pardot, send it over. They'll figure it out when they get there. Either way, it's very flexible. But the whole goal is you need, you need speed. And one of the things is like, you know, speed kills in an automobile, but it also does a great job in sales, right? So speed is important for sales to get on something. So if a lead looks like they're ready based on them engaging a lot, or maybe they click a button that says, call me. That's the case. You want to get right over to sales. And nothing's faster than an automation continually looking for a criteria. And as soon as it's met, he it sends it right over to Salesforce for their attention. You could have, assign them a lead with a task associated with it. You could send them a little alert email, wave flags, ring bells. You've got a new lead. And also automation ties into the concept of scoring and grading. A lot of different apps out there have the ability to do lead scoring. Has anyone ever used just lead scoring by themselves? What was your experience with it? Typically, when people use lead scoring by themselves, sales hates it. The reason why, yes, not good. The reason why is because it's very one-dimensional. It's okay, this person clicked a lot and they're the CMO or they're not the CMO, but I can't really tell how good of a lead they are. I only know that they've done a lot of clicking or a lot of attending or a lot of this and that. And so you need the scoring to tell you how interested they are in you and the grading is how interested you are in them. When you have those two dimensions, you're able to really show sales who they should call first. If you have 62 leads in your lead queue, you need to start showing them who to call first. Help them prioritize. Do the work for them. Uh, another one. Uh, sales doesn't even look at the lead score. It's worse than being hated, right? <laughs> or it's worth, um, yeah, it, it's not worth doing, right? Because when they hate you, they don't even look at it. Um, also need to start utilizing the contact roles. Preaching the choir, Caitlin. Totally agree. And uh, Kanako, yeah, absolutely on the lead score. Here is a little bit of a deep dive in the automation with Pardo. Yeah, right on schedule. That is a good thing. That lets me not talk quite as fast. So here's an example of lead over here. Okay, here's an automation rule. And what we're doing here is based on that earlier example, somebody filled out a form a couple times. What we're saying is, okay, their score is greater than 100 because they've taken a certain number of actions. Their grade is greater than D, meaning they didn't do something that disqualified them. Sometimes the countries don't sell to someone in Indonesia. And if you don't sell to them, you probably should decrease their grade score or their grade. So you can increment, but you can decrease as well. So if some, or someone says, I'm a student doing research. Great, keep doing your research, but I don't need to send you to sales, right? You're an F. So if that's the case, this, this wouldn't match you and you wouldn't be sent to sales, which is really effective to everyone's point in the chat you can save yourself a lot of grief by not sending really terrible, obvious bad leads over to sales. Finally, I have their phone number. 
you need to be able to call them. They've told me that in our meetings, they wanna be able to call them, so I will make sure I get them a phone number before I send them over. If so, assign them to Casey. I could then say assign them to a queue, assign them to the Salesforce queue. And if I wanted to, I could have separate rules like this that say, and if they're in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Maine, Vermont, these other states, assign them to Casey because that's his territory. So this is roughly how that works. Um, cool. So these can be used for a lot of different things. You can use them for specific trade shows to welcome new customers. You can have automated emails send out one-time things based on these automation rules. They're fantastic. It's like an if-then logic behind the scenes of a part of. And again, there's a webinar on grading and scoring. There's also a webinar on better integrating with sales. Uh, separate ones, actually. How are the scores determined? Yeah, let's go ahead and address that real quick before we carry on to reporting. Uh, not fair, yeah, I know. Um, the scores are determined, um, and again, there's a whole webinar on this. See, it's all, okay saying that because we're, we're, it's, it's all part of a game. But otherwise, it'd be really annoying. I'm sure you can all agree. So uh, typically, the way scoring works, and the good news is scoring is actually default, built into Pardot, and I don't recommend changing it that much, actually. It's actually very good the way it's set up. And uh, what it does is it increases your score one point every web page you look at, three points every time you click, 50 points every time you fill out a form. Uh, 50 points every time you register for a webinar. Hey, so you all get 50 points in our system. All right. Um, and oftentimes you could say 50 points for attending. So there's all these different kinds of things that are built in there and they're behind the scenes. And what it does is you don't need to stress out about the amount as much. Just know that the more people interact and engage, the more that, that score increases. So I never tell sales and our team specifically what points matter. I just know, hey, I tell them, look, the bigger these numbers, the more stuff they're consuming. Instead, I want their attention looking, looking at the grade. So we have our sales group sort first by grade and then by score. Well, that's the best practice, right? Call the A's first. You can call the most engaged one, then the second most engaged one, the third one. But the grade is really critical for them. And then the score is good, good to know. The score is very much a marketing device that lets us know this person's engaged enough that it's probably time to then send them over to sales for a look. Great question. Deborah, here we go back again, that triple layer decadent chocolate fudge cake with a chocolate tips cherry on top. And I see the cookies in the background as well. So anyone else that's hungry, uh, there's cookies in the back. Oh, and the, uh, Deborah, there's chocolate cake over there in the right, in the corner. So if you're to help yourself. So we're, we'll get to the last part here. Then we'll wrap up with resources and then let everyone go. Uh, and then anyone who wants to stay for Q&A, you're here. So finally is reporting. And it's not last, oh, it's last, but not least. So really I credit um, my company changing, turning around that first time I was using marketing automation, with that company, just a marketing manager at a company, it turned that company around. It also turned my career, it's like rocket fuel for my career. I literally went from being marketing manager, marketing coordinator, to a VP of marketing in just a few years because I started showing ROI of marketing. It really changed the whole conversation from, okay, another thousand dollars for marketing, wonder if we'll ever see that again, right, to Hey, marketing, you did all that with 5K. Could you do, what could you do with 10? Or how about 20, right? And you're like, oh, geez, I don't know if it can scale. It's a different problem to have, but it really changes the conversation. And there's a couple things to think about. The first thing we want to talk about is first touch ROI tracking. And for those who aren't marketers, the whole concept of this is where did I first meet you? What was your source, <clears throat> your lead source? It's very critical. And this is also the very first question you want to answer in marketing. It's the most important question in marketing. It is what's working and what's not working. If I spent 20 grand to go to this big conference and have a booth and send my sales team there and do all this collateral and take people to dinner, was that helpful or not? I don't know. If you don't know, it could be a real challenge. But if you know, you use pay-per-click, you gave Google five grand and you got you know, a thousand leads out of it that turned into $2 million worth of business. Okay, now we're, now we're now we're cooking here. That's how you start getting more budget from uh, the C-suite is because you start showing what you've done with the money that you've invested. It's fantastic. Question, is lead source a high level bucket, webinar, event, website, or does it need to be more specific? Um, there's a, some great conversation around that. There's also a webinar on that topic, but um, yeah, a great question. You can actually make it whatever you want. So what typically what we'll do is we'll make that the specific source that they came from. 
Um, and one thing you'll see now with what's called connected campaigns is you can have you can have a hierarchy of campaigns. So you can make it very specific and you can always bubble back to the big bucket later. So there's a little bit of fine, fine tuning there, but yeah, you, you can make it specific and then later on you can go back and you can, you can sort of aggregate all the things into the bigger bucket. Great question. All right, uh, has anyone ever been to a world tour or an or a elite event? Anyone been to a Salesforce world tour? By the way, we probably will go a little bit over here. So if you're okay with that, great. Otherwise, definitely check out the recording for the resources. World tour, I see world tour. I see uh, Dreamforce, yeah. And this is probably you know a picture from one of them. We, we were working with a client. I don't know if any of you use events uh, as one of your primary modes of marketing. But this one particular client we're working with use events all the time. In fact, they use 80 events. Some, uh, they used to do about 80 events a year which is a lot of events to coordinate. Sending a booth, sending sales teams, sending staff, collateral, sending a second booth. They had like a couple different booths. They were flying all around, shipping all around, right? That's a lot of work. I don't know if anyone's ever done 80. I mean, you go ahead and throw how many, how many trade shows you do a year in, in, the, in the chat if you want. Um, they are doing 80. The challenge was, even though they had Pardot, they weren't using campaign tracking. They didn't have first touch ROI set up. And it's very straightforward to set up and start using it. They didn't have this set up yet. So they're like, help us. Because the, what had happened was they're doing all these trade shows and they were getting business from somewhere. They were getting new deals, but they didn't know where they came from. So they were basically hostage to doing all 80. In fact, every time they added one, they could never stop adding it because they never knew if the business they got from it was from that particular show. I mean, one off, they would know, but overall they wouldn't. You know, okay, Deborah, sounds like some of you are doing some trade shows. Well, the challenge was they didn't know which ones were affected. So one of the first things we did one of the very first things we did was set up ROI tracking with them, Pardot First Touch campaigns. And when we did this, we were able to help them see which ones were working, which ones weren't working. Any guesses in the chat, what number of trade shows were actually effective? What number of trade shows out of the 80 were driving business? Go ahead and throw it in the chat. So there's 80 trade shows. How many were actually driving business? Okay, a lot of really quick answers from some very cynical people. Love it. I see fives. I see tens. I see elevens. Fives. Wow, that would be terrible. It wasn't as bad. Um, uh, and not sure your question, Justin, on measuring uh, Rob. Uh, but go ahead and ask that again, or throw it in the oh, ROI. So how do you measure that? Well, you know, you know if you got the leads from that source. So you're able to put it in the system. You're able to say, I got all these people from that event. I met them all. This is the first time I've ever met them. That's their first touch source. So by doing that and then saying, okay, um, it cost me five grand to go to that event, you can actually put the five grand into Pardot. It keeps track of their first touch source. When, they, when some of them go on to become opportunities and contact role is used, then you're able to link the two up. And so what ends up happening is when they become closed one revenue at the end, Pardot is able to go grab that amount and drag it all the way back to the beginning and show you spent five grand and it turned into $2 million worth of business, right? So that's how it's able to show. It's really cool. Um, a great question. I'm glad you asked that. I, I sometimes take it for granted. But back to that earlier question, how many of those shows were effective? It was actually 30. So it was 30 shows out of 80 were effective. But that meant they were spending buku dollars on 50 shows that were doing nothing, absolutely nothing. I mean, you could argue brand, but this was an expensive branding exercise. 50 shows with no ROI, no business from those 50 shows. They immediately stopped doing those after those reports were coming in and were able to reinvest those dollars to upgrade their participation in the current events that were functioning, that were effective, and then do other things, like do other projects and increase their ability to use Salesforce, all those cool things. So it was a, it was a great story. That shows what ROI is all about. Now we're running out of time, so I just wanna cover at a very high level, the word campaign use is used very often, right? In the Marine Corps, it's, it's a hat. In marketing, it's like an effort we're doing. And so for some of those who are Salesforce admins, it typically used as an effort that something like marketing is doing this sort of multiple asset effort. We're seeing an email, maybe we have a direct mail, we're gonna have a webinar. And it might be like a webinar campaign with several emails, a webinar invite, follow up. It's like a it's a it's a collection of effort typically in marketing. In first touch though, it's used uh, in part, excuse me, it's used as a first touch track in Salesforce. You know that old campaign thing that's been there that we don't use to use very often? It's been used to touch now in multiple touches. So you can only be in one Pardot campaign, but you can be in multiple Salesforce campaigns. So it's been used as like a multi-touch tracking in Salesforce, but not very well until more recently. 
Now we have a thing called Connected Campaigns. And Connected Campaigns, there is a webinar on this. We just did it. It was awesome. There's an hour worth to talk about on Connected Campaigns. But what's really cool about it is it joins the Pardot and Salesforce campaigns together. Oh, thank you, Caitlin. Sounds like you were there. Uh, it joins Pardot and Salesforce campaigns together. What this does is it actually enables you to do first and multi-touch ROI reporting if you're doing the tagging. Now, mostly it's about the prep work. So a good portion of that webinar was all about the prep work. So I would recommend going and checking that thing out. Um, and uh, there's a lot to do on it. But the cool thing is it enables really neat reporting like this, where you can show, okay, what are the campaigns that are working? To the earlier question about buckets, this takes your buckets to the next level. Not only can you see, okay, direct marketing was 155, you can click into that and see where the children campaigns. There's a whole hierarchy of campaigns. You can click into it and see, oh, what, uh, what event actually drove this or drove that? Social media drove 675K. What channel was it? LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook? What was it? You can actually dive into it. So all of these things come from that. And Caitlin, I totally hear you. A webinar on B2B MA sounds like um, something a lot of people will be interested in. So we will do that. And yes, the previous slide, uh, this one, this one, Bobby, we'll, we'll keep going. But yeah, the, uh, the recording will have the slides in it for sure. All right, a uh, couple more things. And for those that, uh, if you have to leave because you have a hard stop, sayonara. But for everyone else, what we're gonna do is talk about the roadmap for marketing automation, and then we'll talk resources and then we'll do some Q&A. All right. So real quick, uh, you know, when you have a menu like this, you need to plan it out, right? You need to have, you don't want to have the appetizer come last. You know, how many times have we talked about going to a restaurant and getting dessert first? I don't know if anyone's ever done that, but you need to have a little, little pathway to this. And one of the things we found is that a lot of people knew part out really well. Um, but a lot of times that you knew, you knew it well, but you'd use it like MailChimp. We're like, what are you doing? Don't do that. It's so powerful. It's also expensive. So let's really maximize this. Realize no one had given anyone an order to the chaos. Everyone, even you see out there, consultants do this, and it drives me crazy. You'll see, here are the 10 most unused features of Pardot that you should use tomorrow. Talk about a distraction. They're unused for a reason. So the most important thing to do here is to have a path. And so we have this thing called the Cheshire Success Index. It's for marketing automation, and it's a 10-step roadmap from start to finish. And it talks about you do this first, then do this, then do this. And one of the things you need to know is not only is it a roadmap, but we have a question, like a questionnaire, an assessment tied to it. So if you get on the phone with us, we call it a CSI call. We can go through 10 questions with you. And at the end of it, you're going to know three things. You're going to know where you're at. You're going to know your next step. You're also going to know what maximized marketing automation looks like. So it's called a CSI and we go through it. Now I have all the steps here. So I'm just gonna talk briefly and kind of scroll through them for those on the recording. But the good news is we actually have a whole webinar on the CSI itself. Um, and if you like what you see, you could actually just say CSI in the chat. And what we'll do is we'll reach out and schedule a CSI call with you. So there are several phases to this. There are several steps to this. You can see nurturing in there. You can see data preparedness and again, every single one of these steps has a webinar associated with it. And it's like, Casey, does that mean there's 10 webinars? Yes, there's 10 separate webinars and we do two of them a month on one of these topics. You see lead grading and scoring in there. You see A-B testing and optimization, multi-touch and advanced reporting. But this is the order that we want you to go in. Um, and the, the neat thing is when you do it in order, it's actually easier. And it also makes all the future steps easier and you get ROI on what you're doing, you can show it sooner than later. So that's the whole point. And if you, yeah, and so I see several of you have typed in CSI, that's great. We'll, we'll reach out and we do a CSI call. We get on the call, we ask you about all 10 of these things. And at the end of it, you'll have a number. And maybe you're a two, maybe you're a three. We've had people that are zeros, but now they're fours, which means they actually, they, they move their marketing automation by 400%, right? That's amazing. Um, and we've had some people that are tens. So it's just good to know where you're at, where your next step is. Okay, for those of us still on here, I know there's a lot of you, let's talk about resources and then let's meet the chefs. And that's my friend Luca right there on MasterChef. Has anyone seen MasterChef? Throw it in the chat. I don't, throw your favorite season or if you've seen it, go ahead and throw that in the chat. Man. All right, a couple resources to tell you about before we get out of here. We already know about the webinars <laughs> because we've talked a lot about them, but podcasting is huge. It's one of my passions. There's two podcasts that Cheshire Impact does. First one I really wanna highlight for you um, is Pardot Life Hacks, especially if you're coming over from 
the Salesforce admin side and you want to get if you want to get gritty on all the technical facets and features of Pardot, Jennifer uh, Schneider does this and she's amazing. And uh, she will prepare her, every single one of her episodes. She spends so much time on it and she'll talk about a particular topic. I have a webinar on connected campaigns. She has a whole series on it, a whole series on it. And it thing, does things like the context. Why do we do this? What, what's the preparation for it? All those, yeah, and I see Caitlin's awesome in the chat. Absolutely. Uh, no, Caitlin, you said Jennifer's awesome, but you're awesome too. Um, so definitely check out Pardot Life Hacks. These podcasts are everywhere you can find podcasts. iTunes, they're also on Stitcher, Spotify, all those different apps. So you can find it there. Also, the Hardcore Marketing Show, if you haven't heard about that, that's my podcast. And I interview some amazing marketers on there. Uh, thought leaders, I recently interviewed someone on our own team, one of our own strategists, get an inside look. You know, maybe some of the people you're working with, if you're working with us at Chesh, you can see some of the people you're working with, but also VIPs, authors of marketing books. I also recently had a chat with Matt Squeezy from, from Salesforce, the man himself, and also spent about an hour and a half with Peter Fader, who's a professor at Wharton in marketing. So, you know, these are the kind of thought leaders that it's amazing to learn from, and you get to hear them straight on that show. So check that show out as well. Also. The CSI, there's so much to it. We talked about there's webinars on that topic. There's also a book coming out. And if you're interested, I can send you a preview of it. This is going to be out December 2019. That's this year. So it'll be up on Amazon in November. I'm sure you'll get a bunch of emails about it. Uh, and then in December, it's going to be in paper form. So this is, this is not marketing collateral here. This is actual book. And I'm super excited to, uh, to share it all with you. So if you want to see a preview of that, just shoot me an email. Say, hey. Give me a sneak peek and we'll get you a sneak peek. All right. Lastly, Cheshire Impact. If you haven't met us, we don't all wear hats, uh, but, uh, but we all are winners here and great people. Some of the smartest people I've ever worked with. Uh, and we're just really here to help you maximize marketing automation and Salesforce. So a lot of folks know we do work with Pardot. We also work with Salesforce. So issues on either side, we're happy to help. Our, my big takeaway from you is to schedule a CSI assessment and then also um, we have workshops, we have webinars, and we have workshops, and we have campaign execution too. A lot of times we do the heavy lifting for you as a marketer or as an admin, so you can keep doing what you're doing, and we'll do the heavy lifting for you. Uh, and then finally, hit me up. Those are my details. Oh, finally, on that contest, this marks the end of the contest. So um, whatever your number is for the number of times I've mentioned that W word or a phrase around it, go ahead and email that. Um, don't say it in the chat. You're, you're trying to help everybody else out. Um, <laughs> so go ahead and uh, email me that, and we will send you some prizes uh, from that. Okay. Let's go ahead, and we will end the recording. Thanks to all listening. 